Good afternoon, everyone. And I wish to offer each of you my warmest welcome to our conversation today on writing about the life beyond with Catherine Wolf and George Saunders, connected by a longtime friendship, a shared love of teaching and writing and upbringings that shaped their interest in faith in our society. These are two extraordinary and imaginative authors and we are honored to have them in dialogue and for them to share their reflections with us. And I wish to thank our colleague, colleagues for their support of this event, the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs, the Lannan Center for Poetics and Social Practice, the Georgetown Humanities Initiative and Georgetown College. And we are pleased to have Paul Eli serving as the moderator of our conversation. Paul is a senior fellow at our Berkeley Center. He is the curator of our faith and culture lecture series, now in its 14th year. He's also the author of two books, The Life You Save May Be Your Own and Reinventing Bach. Paul also previously served for two decades with Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, a publishing house based in New York City. He's a regular contributor to The New Yorker. Last week, we began our Summer Hilltop Immersion Program for rising sophomore and transfer students on our main campus. In one of its courses, Paul will be teaching George Saunders' celebrated work, Lincoln and the Bardo. In Lincoln and the Bardo, George tells a story drawing on President Lincoln's experience following the death of his 11-year-old son, Willie. The, the setting of the book is Oak Hill Cemetery here in Georgetown, where the president's son was entombed for three years just before Lincoln's own tragic death toward the end of the Civil War. George takes us into Lincoln's difficult journey in the wake of his son's loss, using the word bardo in the book's title, taken from the tradition of Tibetan Buddhism to describe the spiritual depths he so profoundly sought during his mourning. In Paul's course this summer, students will have the experience of visiting Oak Hill Cemetery and reflecting together on themes and ideas within George's book and their intersection with the course's title, The Whole Person. George's writing draws on some of the most authentic and humanistic elements of realism in the literary tradition. He offers ways of understanding and perceiving spirituality in the imagined world. And through an exceptional body of work, including a new book, A Swim in the Pond in the Rain, drawn from a course he teaches at Syracuse on the Masters of Russian Literature, he has been recognized as a winner of the prestigious Man Booker Prize and the inaugural Rathbone's Folio Prize. And Catherine Wolf began her career as a therapist and addictions counselor, and she then served as the director of the Arupe Center for Community-Based Learning at Santa Clara University and later as a member of the chaplaincy at Stanford University. She is the editor of a published anthology entitled, Not Less Than Everything, uh, Catholic Writers on Heroes of Conscience. And the book provides reflections from Catholic figures such as St. Ignatius of Loyola. It includes her husband, Tobias Wolf, in his own writing as an award-winning author of, of memoirs and short stories. And it also includes reflections from our moderator, Paul Eli, exploring ideas embedded in the artistry and imagination of Caravaggio. Catherine writes, and I quote, how can we conceive of something we've never experienced directly? Something that by definition lies beyond us, that has always been sought, but never quite found, close quote. These are questions that Catherine poses and seeks to engage as the author of a new book published this year entitled Beyond How Humankind Thinks About Heaven. She takes us deeper with carefully crafted writing across multiple dimensions of history, culture, and geography to provide a sweeping set of vantage points and perspectives for us to consider. Among them, Dante and the Divine Comedy, 
and the vision of St. Paul, helping us to understand further how our perceptions of heaven and existence beyond death have evolved throughout the millennia. So I wish to express my deepest gratitude to both Catherine and George for taking this time and sharing their reflections together with our community this afternoon. And I want to thank you all for joining us for your, for your participation in this conversation. Let me now turn this, open, this over now to Paul Eli. Thank you very much, President Joya, for those uh, words of welcome and for hosting this event. I really appreciate it. Thanks to the Penguin Random House for their support for this event through Riverhead Books and also for connecting us to East City Bookshop, a local Washington bookseller. And you can support uh, the book and the shop by purchasing Beyond using the link that's in the chat box. And the books that you purchase will include a signed book plate uh, while supplies last. A couple of other notes about the event. It's being recorded and captioned video will be posted to the event page on the Berkeley Center's website uh, fairly soon. And if you registered for today's event, you'll receive an email with the captioned video when it is ready. And at the end of this event, the last 15 minutes or so, we'll take questions from the audience for both Catherine Wolf and George Saunders. Please join the conversation by opening the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen and typing in your question. Uh, so with all that behind us, let's, um, let's talk about the beyond. Uh, Catherine and George, this spring, uh, I found myself reading Dante. It was a, it's the 700th anniversary of Dante's death. And as I was reading Dante, then proofs of, of your book, Catherine, arrived. And it was really striking to realize that uh, on some level, you and Dante and George Saunders have a rough and ready equality in that um, you've all written with authority in different ways about the life beyond. But on some level, um, nobody knows. It was awesome to me to realize that Dante constructed this work that's the divine comedy while having no experiential knowledge of the life beyond. It's, it's, it's all drawn from the imagination. I just kind of paused in awe at that thought and then um, uh, kind of brought it back to both of your works. And I thought I would ask you, you know, what is it like um, to, to, to spend this part of your life trying to make uh, the beyond something that none of us has any direct experience of credible and interesting and, and vivid for the reader? I guess, um, hoping that's an, an, an issue that's engaged you both, but let's begin with Catherine. When you told me about this project uh, at Cafe Leopold several years ago, I, I didn't know that it was possible. Uh, oh. <laughs> thousands of years, <laughs> many traditions, a readable uh, book, but it, it's more than possible. You've really done it. Uh, how, what was it like to spend several years in the in the company of, um, the ghosts and the shades and uh, the freshly dead and try to put that onto the page. Oh, you know, it, it was a, it was a wonderful thing. It, the, the image of a journey is a hackneyed one by, by now, but boy, I really felt I, I walked a very long road. Um, I was so fortunate early on. Um, I've had many guides, it, just practically speaking, with my friends who are at Stanford and Santa Clara telling me how to even begin to approach this project. But really, um, it was when I found that in all the religious, major religious traditions, there were guides, there were people who went to the afterlife and came back and made a report. Um, now, you have to set aside whether we moderns would give any credence to their reports. Um, but for the people that they reported back to, they had great meaning and really shaped their religion. And to a certain extent, I think Dante's in that tradition. Um, you get everybody from the righteous Viraz in, in Zoroastrianism um, to Ezekiel in Judaism and Dante and so forth. Um, and so they were very rich stories. Um, and what and there actually were a lot of things that they had in common. Um, and so there was some residence there, but obviously there was a great diversity as well. Um, but then of course, then when I went to the Eastern religions, it was, it was a different matter and there were guides there too, but they found the afterlife to be another sort of place. Um, so anyway, I did, I was able to frame the book around those guides 
because otherwise, as somebody said to me, it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose because there was just so much information um, everywhere I looked. And, um, and, I, and I needed then also for coherence, because I couldn't just turn the fire hose on the reader, I needed to really locate them within their religious traditions. So that's why this, it's, it, it, the book is divided into sections by the major religions and then you know, contemporary thought. It's because in order to understand those ideas and to appreciate um, those figures and to understand how in their exercise of the imagination, they really did encounter a reality that they then did, did share um, with their fellow, um, their, the people in their faith tradition, um, you really have to understand what the religion is about. So I had to kind of locate it, uh, those journeys in the tradition uh, that they were in. So met a lot, of, a lot of people along the way. I detect a pattern here. If you think about Dante, he, writes a narrative in which um, the poet Dante in the Divine Comedy uh, has a guide figure, Virgil. Then for many of us, Dante is the guide. And then you write about Dante and to some extent you become our guide. Uh, oh dear. Of course, of, of writing about the book. And, yes. and so it goes. Uh, you, you mentioned the tone you've struck is really attractive. Um, you write as a, as a Christian but someone whose world has been enlarged, I guess, through this encounter with the, the beyond as it's conceived of in other traditions? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I, you know, it really, it, it was flummoxing to me for a while because, you know, in the West, we tend to think it's a one shot deal. In the East, they tend to think that there's life after life after life. And there were some, some real paradoxes that I had to hold while being very respectful of the people that I was interviewing and reading about. Um, but there, there's a theologian named Mark Heim who wrote a book called Salvations. And he kind of cracked this open for me because he posited that um, religious fulfillment comes about, you know, you hope towards the end of your life and beyond because you've lived in a kind of comprehensive way within a religious tradition. But maybe doing that within different traditions takes you to a different place. Maybe we are not, I mean, I used to think of there are many paths to the same destination. Maybe there are different destinations. He just suggested that, um, that, that we may end up in different places. And that was really something I, a, a paradox that I have to hold because of course I am a believing Christian. On the other hand, it does solve the problem of all the respectful, you know, the very fervent Buddhists and whoever who are going to who are thinking of a whole other reality that they're going to. So that was that was something that enabled me to sort of keep going with this project, and but really kind of blew open the boundaries of my own faith as well. I mean, all the wise people I read said studying other religions really deepens your own faith, um, and 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 I really felt that. Um, on the other hand, I had to really open up my own appreciation for these other people, these faiths of very wonderful people that I met and spoke personally with. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's just something I will carry. It's this whole thing. If anybody wants to get an answer for my book, I'm sorry, you're not going to get it. You're going to get a whole lot of really powerful suggestions, you know. And so I've had to just come to a place in my own faith life where, um, you know, I have this awareness that I, I feel that there is a reality out there that beckons to us. I feel as though I need to live my life in awareness of that and maybe even in, in, in openness and even in pursuit of that. Um, but it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not something I'm ever gonna really reach the fulfillment of that understanding until I'm there. One of the things that surprised me about the book is that it doesn't have the whiff of the library about it. You draw on so much material, but every so often there's a conversation with somebody that you know about uh, the beyond. And a, a couple of those conversations, as far as I can tell, um, there's the conversation with Paula Saunders and then there's an implied conversation with George Saunders. Yes. Was George, and either one of you could weigh in here, what, what was that conversation like? Who was the guide and who was the lead? in that conversation. Maybe I'll let George answer that. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 uh, I think Catherine was the, both the guide and the lead. She, she was 
a wonderful interviewer. And so, and the book itself is such a gift. I, I've been enjoying it these last four days. And, you know, Catherine, you said that uh, there are no answers, but the, what I took away from the book was this delicious sense of urgency, you know, that, that all these people have preceded us in asking these questions and now is our turn. And the only real deficiency would be to do that with, you know, low energy or, or old habits. So that, I really thank you for that. It was just a gorgeous trip. Um, yeah, no, I think I, what, what came through in the interview with Catherine and also in the book itself is just this incredible uh, generosity of spirit that is able to be very true to her own faith and very passionate about it and entirely open to other, other people's stuff, you know? And that's, I think, a pretty rare combination where you, there's no, in the book, there's never a moment where you doubt that this writer has vivid, strong beliefs and at the same time is completely open to whatever the world is telling her. It was a really delightful uh, place to be. And it really inspired me to kind of look up a little bit and, and um, become a better person. <laughs> so thank you, Catherine, for that. Well, thank you for that. I'm glad it came across that way. I have to tell you the first draft was like the biggest grad school term paper I ever wrote. You know what I mean? And my wonderful editor, uh, Jake Morrissey at Riverhead, wrote back, he said, you got it all. You got all the information. He said, yeah, but I know you, when people come out to the Bay Area, you love to take people around on a tour and show them your favorite places and tell them all the stories about them. And he said, do that with him. Mm. <laughs> so he did. made yeah. me a guide. He sort of ordained me the, as a guide, the way Paul was was speaking you know, about, you know? And I thought yeah. that was, so I, I did rewrite it to try to have, a voice that would bring the reader along with me so that what I was finding out and and what was becoming part of me as I was finding out, that they would have that experience too. That's exactly how it was. One, one of the real astonishments of the book is you can see the, the rigor of the research, but you never feel it. It's very novelistic and narrative. And, and I had several times that feeling of, oh, I wonder what these human beings are going to come up with next, you know, in terms of. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> it's really, uh, yeah, yeah. Indeed, yeah. Well, as you know, from the last section, we are coming up with all kinds of really. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. We really are. We really are. The, this whole quest for the afterlife has been until modern times, pretty much packaged in religions of various sorts, but not, not so much now. You know? Right, right. Yeah. George, when you mentioned that it, um, the, I, I don't want to say the not the lightness of the book, but the ease uh, with which difficult material is conveyed. There's a similar ease with the fact that this book is, you know, substantially about death. Uh, this is about the apprehension that people have of the afterlife, especially as as that approaches. You touch on it in your own life, getting older. You describe the death of your father. And then of your brother who figured into our conversation in the green room beforehand, what was it? Um, can you speak about those experiences and how they inform uh, your, your sense of beyond pe people close to you dying? Oh, yes. Uh, particularly. Let us know who they were since I know the story, but the viewers don't. Right, right. Particularly with my brother, who I was very, very close to. He was really kind of my mentor in a lot of ways. And I, we worked together for many years at Santa Clara University very closely. So we had a professional uh, relationship as well. Um, and he died well before uh, I ever uh, embarked on this book. Um, but I did feel him as a guide. I very much felt him as a guide, and I don't, I don't speak about these things lightly. Um, although when I was writing this book, lots of people related things like this to me. But there were times when I was writing or stuck, or just not figuring something out, I would just lay myself open. And there were some times when I felt like Bill was just right there. Mm -hmm. You know, move me on a little bit, and as I say, I, I don't, I don't make much of these things, um, but I, but they, but they happen. No, they happen. <laughs> and the thing I think that enabled me to keep going too, is because I was born in a family that was very faith-filled, very questioning. It's full of Jesuits, um, but also, we, oh, we we lived in we live in hope. We live in hope, and if there's one thing that I hope the reader comes away with is this sense that, that there is hope, 
And there has been hope ever since people started leaving little seeds and grade goods in the, in the, in the, in where they were burying their mother because they thought, well, maybe she'll need some, maybe she's gonna keep going somewhere. And that's something that I really think is, I, I would say it is essentially human. And I think we need hope right now. Yeah. I really oh, well, go on, George. Oh, sorry. Well, I was gonna say, I love the sense in the book that uh, one uniquely human capability is to, to feel even tiny, tiny slices of the eternal or God, and then be drawn toward that thing. And that's actually what the sacramental is. It's saying, well, I did once feel m more love in my heart. I felt more at peace. So if I felt it once, it must be out there somewhere and I can move toward it. And that's an innately hopeful thing, I think. It is, it, it is. And the other, yeah, the other thing that I tapped into that, as George knows, I'm a very practical person. I was a social worker for many years um, and a university administrator and really a pragmatist. And, um, I, you know, I did tend to think of mystics as people who, you know, sat, sat up on mountaintops, you know, with not many clothes on, I didn't eat. And, <laughs> But, but what I found was that in every tradition, religious tradition, and now with people pursuing out of body experience, that people have a sense that within the moment, we can rise beyond. Um, so that we, are, we come off this linear plane that we are stuck on. We don't have to be stuck there, you know? And so I'm very drawn to that right now. And there were many instances in the book where I found out, for instance, primal people's sense of an every when that they're living in, which is an eternal moment. We think of everywhere, but an every when. Mm -hmm. um, or I think of uh, Rabbi Heschel with his book called The Sabbath, which is so beautiful about how the Sabbath is this one day of week that is God's time. So it's the, you know, it's vertical. It's not the linear human time, it's vertical. And then you start reading mystics of, of various stripes and they're all after that encounter that they feel like may be possible just now in this moment on earth. Um, a wonderful uh, Hindu poet named Kabir said, seekers, listen, wherever you are is the entry point. Mm -hmm. Beautiful which very much runs akin to the Jesuit idea of meeting people where they are. Absolutely. There's a pattern that was apparent to me in the material you chose, partly because I was reading Lincoln and the Bardo again, at the same time as I was rereading Jan. And it's the pattern of, which most vividly comes up in your account of your father's death, as, as he draws near to God in his mind, as death approaches, he feels God drawing near to him. And George, that seemed to me so akin to the pattern of people drawing near to each other and merging that that is the, the significant action of Lincoln and the Bardo. Am I right? And did you work that out after reading some text or was it an artistic thing? How did that come about? No, you're exactly right. And it was a total surprise to me. And this, uh, I think Catherine and I have talked about this before that you know, as we, uh, you know, go in search of something like God or the divine, this, uh, I felt it again and again in ways I can't explain, the imagination or, you know, in my case, honestly, just revision of a text somehow uh, does something. I, what I would say it does is it reduces the level of rumination that I'm doing and it activates a different part of the mind. And suddenly the intuition is really responsive and really um, it's working alongside you really. So in the book, I had no intention whatsoever of all those people kind of coming to the light. It, it honestly just happened. And once it had happened, I could look at it and say, oh, I believe in that. I think, you know, I, I've been calling it viral goodness where, you know, it's actually possible that a community of people with their eyes in the right direction could begin to resemble each other in in positive action. It's also possible it could go the other way. Uh, but it was totally, I mean, you know, this is a too grandiose of a world word, but it was sort of revealed in the revision, always on the smallest level, like what what little character do you want to do right now? And he would say, what are my choices? You say, well, you know, you can do A, B, or C. And on in very mechanical ways, C would turn out to be the, the most active or energized choice doing that over and over again. And pretty soon this whole community is doing just as you described, Paul. So it was kind of a surprising, uh, I talk a lot about the power of the subconscious, but I'd never seen it demonstrated in quite that way. And the effect was that the book 
told me what I really believe about human communities, you know, which, you know, if you'd asked me, I would have said, oh, I, I don't have an opinion on that. But once I written it up, I thought, yeah, I actually think that is possible. And there is a lot of hope in the, uh, this kind of mutually reinforcing goodness, but it was pure, you know, sort of intuition plus iteration, I would say. You know? Yeah. It's well, so you know, powerful to hear because I expected, I was going to set you up and say, well, you know, George, Walker Percy in one of his last kind moments said, there aren't any good Buddhist novels because Buddhism is too abstract. And here you proved him wrong by dramatizing the bardo and making this collective action on the part of these characters real, but you were working in the dark and found your way toward, uh, toward a movement that then weirdly converged with some of the themes that you had in play in the book already. Is that right? right. Which they will, you know, I think that's the thing about the subconscious is it, it's very contextual. So if you, if I have beliefs in my life and my life looks a certain way and I revise assiduously, all that stuff is going to come in and it's going to come in in a much more nuanced and uh, agreeable way than if I had decided in advance to put it there, you know? So uh, I think it is a, a Buddhist novel only because the writer was Buddhist, you know, and also because then he bothered to revise, you know? <laughs> The, the revision is Buddhist and the uh, first draft is uh, raw intuition, non-denominational. Like <laughs> but even the, yeah, yeah. But even the, you know, the, um, the, the revision is, is, ev is every spiritual tradition, I think, because what you're essentially doing is you're seeing what textual moment you're in and then you're responding whole, whole selfedly to that moment without too much conceptualization or rationalization. So in a sense, it's sort of, it's not mystic, but it's certainly intuitive. And you're bringing elements of yourself to it that aren't, in my experience, aren't readily available on a given day. So something opens up and, you know. I think that's really powerful. I took that away from your book on the Russian writers, which I've been reading also, that we're, we're accustomed to thinking of revision as a clerical act that's alien to intuition. When I think about it, as you, you're maximizing your in, intuition because yes. you're leaving the bad stuff away. Instead of having to you know, hit a foul shot in the NBA playoffs at one moment, mm -hmm. I get to have all my best days wind up in the text and the bad days I leave out, uh, something like that. That's exactly it. And it, it, you know, when I was reading Catherine's book, I was struck by how much holiness and honest responsiveness are related. You know, so if you if you're in a situation, you respond honestly, not with your contrived opinions or your pre-existing ideas, but what's actually happening? What's my actual reaction? That's the I think that's the ideal mode of revisions. And then, like as you say, you do that many thousands of times, and you pick sort of the greatest hits. Uh, and then that resulting pattern makes a kind of a, a super logic that is smarter than the writer, I would say. You know, but, but I, that's in some ways it's not. It, it struck me so many times in reading about Dante or. St. Paul or these other people who were doing a sort of creative writing in a way. I mean, they, they, even if they were in a mystical state, they were doing something like objectifying an imaginative space. And then that comes down to us in the form of a, a vision or pro a prophecy. Very much so. And we did an event earlier this year that was about in part the, the way Dante's transformation is so powerfully packed into the poem that we feel at 700 years later. Uh, according to a number of scholars. I've been wondering, and I already posed this question to both of you online, but uh, take it in either order that suits you. So what has it meant for your lives to, to spend time beyond? Uh, what do you, do you live differently? Do you think differently? Do you write differently? Catherine or George? Well, uh, uh, I'll answer that. It, it, you know, the book unfolded uh, over the course of about five or six years, the last year of which when I was really putting the finishing touches on being this year of the pandemic and of quarantine, um, which I think amplified what was already happening, which was the sense that um, I was starting to live a little bit in a different place than I had lived before. That, that the reality I was living in was bigger and broader and kept on going beyond death. And I, and I, I don't want to sound overly mystical about this, but that really is how I feel. Um, that that 
uh, and it may also have to do with getting older and the pandemic helped because we were all stuck inside for a year. And if you, if you didn't get a little bit mystical, you went nuts, right? I mean, you had to feel part of something that was broader and that was going to keep on going, right? We had to have that. Um, and so I would say, yes, it's just that, that broadening um, and, and also the great gift of it I don't think I mentioned this before, is that having met all these wonderful people, whether on the page or in person, um, I just feel like I am an, I'm a member now of just the biggest family in the, in, uh, the, the family of all people of good faith and of goodwill. And, you know, having been a Roman Catholic all my life, we, we think big, that's a big church. But really now, and that's my tradition, that's actually, if you ask what what my beliefs were, they would align with the Catholic tradition. But I feel myself to be part of a much, much greater family now. Which uh, you you belong to all along, but I've only uh, yes. lately grasped is kind of what you're saying. Yes. We, we all belong to that. Yes. And you've been initiated it into exactly. it more deeply through the experience yes. of writing the book. And what about you, George? Do you, um, imagining what um, people would do in the Bardo for a couple of years, is that, did that wind up affecting the way you wrote or ate breakfast or jog? Yeah, I decided I was not gonna actually die. That was my, my main thing. <laughs> the, you know, the book, I, originally, I think I had the idea that I would study the Tibetan Bardo and faithfully represent it. And after about two weeks, I thought I, I'm not up to that. So um, I think I have a, a dog here, I apologize. But um, so then at some point it, it was, um, the, the one idea I really, brought into the book was this, I think it's a Buddhist idea, but I, I've read it in other traditions. I think Paul actually mentions it in your book, Catherine, this idea that if you want to know what death is like, just look around right now. I mean, your mind is your mind, you, your habits are your habits, your fears are your fears, your capabilities are your capabilities. And of course, also you'll be tired and you may be in pain, you'll maybe be scared, but fundamentally the mind you die with is the mind you live with. Uh, and then this, the other idea that I came across in the Buddhist text was that the, you know, we're very lucky to be, to have physical bodies because even though they're a pain, uh, the most spiritual work can be done when you're embodied. Uh, as in the Buddhist realm, if you're in the realm of the gods, for example, that's really great, but it's harder to make progress because everything's kind of groovy. Uh, so along with this is the idea that you're, so, you're, so your body um, grounds your mind in this life, like, and I think the metaphor is that it's like a wild horse tied to a post. So your your mind is the wild horse, but the body is tying you to a post. When you die, somebody clips that rope, and the mind just goes uh, in all its power, and it goes to past, future, hallucin hallucinations, everything. But as I understand it, the quality of that experience would be related to your mind. It's it's still your mind. So I mean, obviously, a good reason to discipline your mind in this life. But it gave me, a, in the book, it gave me kind of a comical way to proceed, which is to say, all these people who died and the people we meet in the book are people who didn't have a great time here. They're not the well-adjusted you know, spiritual adepts. They all have physical manifestations that correspond to their mental torment. Uh, so, you know, one guy is uh, a suicide and he, he, at the last instant of his life he, he changed his mind and he was struck by how beautiful everything is so he has all these sense organs eyes and ears and hands and you know these kind of cursed with so one thing that didn't you know the, the natural question is okay so if i died what would my what's my you know what 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 thing is going to get supersized in me either for good or ill and that's a question that has has continued <laughs> since, since i've been in the book you know and uh, i won't give you the answer but but you know there something that exists in all of us at any given moment that if you multiplied it by 10,000 would be notable you know so that's my, my take away from the book when you what you said about the embodied condition as the one that um, has the most potential that runs against a lot of preconceptions about religion mm -hmm. I know for me one of the most important books about religion was Flannery O'Connor's essays on fiction and she's mm -hmm. stressing from a literary but also a Catholic perspective, that fiction is the art of putting list slippers on clerks, as she said, drawing on a Flaubert story, that it's about the five senses, it's about people in their embodied state, and that if you're not willing to get down and deal with uh, the stuff of reality, uh, it's not a grand enough job for you. 
So right. what I hear you saying is that even in this work of fiction that has a, um, a religious dimension, the, the incarnational, as we call it in the Catholic tradition, or the kind of embodied part of the book is so, so vital to, to our sense of the whole. Yes, and that's also a principle of fiction because if you just say, do whatever you want, it's hard to do anything. But if you say, it's New Jersey, it's noon, the guy has a slightly sore left knee, and Episcopalian, then you can you can start to do some things. You know, there's um, it, it's you know really the specificity is where the divine goes. You know, to, to make its appearance. Uh, so that was definitely the case. Yeah, yeah. Was that part of your practice, Catherine? Because among the many striking qualities of the book, it's just not abstract. Uh, you're writing about these things that are questioned by some people that happen to be written about a couple, 3,000 years ago in some cases, and yet the voices are there on the page and the particulars and... Um... Well, but that was the gift to me, was that, that the stories came that way. I didn't, I didn't have to start with the guy in New Jersey, pull him out, out of my head, because you know there was the righteous Viraz going up to heaven, having taken this stuff called Henbane. And it was, so it was all these very nitty gritty little details um, that I just was fascinated by. So. I didn't have to make, I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up anyway, right? And I certainly, you know, I certainly didn't have to. It was more reporting this just extraordinarily rich um, activity of, of the imagination that has been going on, uh, you know, since time immemorial, since we started getting afraid of being dead, I suppose. Um, so, so the specificity was given to me. You mentioned the uh, Jesuit family in which you were brought up and the Catholic tradition being really robust. Was there something about our tradition that was um, an aspect of, of our consideration of the afterlife that was kind of born on into you in a fresh way or that you came to a fresh understanding with through this book? Yes, I certainly did not know that there had been an argument that went on for several hundred years about whether we were aiming towards the resurrection of the body or the immortality of the soul, and all the ways in which people tried to settle that. Um, Augustine took a pretty good stab at it, that there was a way in which the soul, even though it was released from the body, yearned for the body, and the bo body would then be as a gift restored, there, there would be a unity, and it would be blessed, and then the spirit would breathe immortality into that. That's a pretty good synthesis, especially when you think of all the arguments they were making back and forth for several hundred years. So, yes. You found really the perfect quote, too. So here's Augustine, who's never at a loss for words, published 50 or 100 books. Yeah. And his, his account in your presentation of what happens to us, um, if we're lucky when we die, is that our, our bo bodies are transmuted into some better thing, <laughs> which is the perfect pitch between specificity and vagueness. We should all hope that we're transmuted into some better thing. Exactly. I've never seen that quote before, and it, it's just the radiance of Augustine's intelligence shines forth in that in that quote. And he's appropriately humble by not trying to describe it over much. That's what I mean. He, yeah. he's, he's humble about almost nothing else, but yes, that's when he comes to the afterlife, he's willing to just say. Yeah, some better thing than this. <laughs> and, and some lesser thinkers um, who might want to get all dogmatic about what heaven is like look a little foolish, really. <laughs> you know, trying to tell people how it's going to be and how they have to believe it's going to be. Hey, you don't know. You don't know. I have another thought that I'm going to park about our Catholic tradition. But um, what about, was there an act? an aspect of the afterlife from a different tradition that uh, that struck you as, hey, that, that's tempting, or I like that, uh, that, that you'd never um, been exposed to before, except through this book. Um, not so much an aspect of the afterlife. It really was, well, let's just not call it afterlife, okay? It, it's, it, it was this strange yeah. in so many religions, um, particularly religions like like the Sufi Muslims really, really resonated with me, this sense of trying to reach beyond within the moment what we're right here, that you, that you live with a receptivity um, to something that might reveal itself now and then. Um, and so, no, there, you know, I, I, there, were, there certainly were so many things that were um, repeated in the, you know, across cultures, this whole idea that we all kind of understand that we're not really gonna be ready 
when we die to go on to whatever a more perfect or more glorious life might be. So there's going to be something like tur purgatory or the Muslims call it Barzakh or, you know, people have very several different constructs about that. But And, you know, in the Eastern religions, it's that you have to go through more life cycles um, to get to where you will be enlightened. And so, you know, there were actually many more congruences than I thought there would be. Um, but I remain very happily within my tradition. Questions are starting to come in. So if you have a question for George Saunders or Catherine Wolf, put it in the Q and A and we'll get to a bunch of them before the end of the hour. The, the question I'd parked about Catholicism. So George, you were a guest at Georgetown speaking in the library a couple of years back and if I'm getting it right, you said something to the effect of, and this may have been in the event, it may have been at supper or whatever, that um, the ex your experience as a writer, and especially of Lincoln and the Bardo, is uh, writing yourself out of or past some preconceptions about religion and, and the beyond that um, had to do with your Catholic upbringing. Mm -hmm. So my question for both of you, I guess, it seems to me that because our tradition is diminished in some ways, that if there's a good thing connected with that is that kids aren't having their heads stuffed full of bearded gods sitting on clouds the way they were 50 years ago. Do you think that's right? And do you think that there's, there's a possibility for um, a better, more complex idea of beyond in, in people today than, than in, in the generation that uh, we and our parents grew up in? Is there an advantage to all this, I guess? That's a great question. I mean, I, I would point to the last few chapters of Catherine's book as a sort of beautiful way of indicating that maybe uh, our definition of religion is just going to get a little more broad shouldered and it's going to be more, um, you know, open to science and science will be more open to it. And also, I think maybe, and this runs through the whole book, the sense that spiritual matters should be fraught with urgency. There, you know, there's not, um, it's not a little nice corner of the library where we go to just check in, but it's the main current in our life is that we're, you know, we, this dawning realization that we're, that we're, we're not separate from everything else and that we're not going to be here forever. That's, that's pretty serious business. So I think that's, um, we'll find, especially maybe in times like this, where people are really looking the wolf in the face a little bit, you know, the, the, the terror of this pandemic and everything, that maybe there'll be a, uh, a chance for religion to kind of shuck off some of those old things and accept accept the new things. It's, uh, to me, it just seems like it's, um, if, if a life doesn't have some kind of spiritual uh, examination in it, it's very crazy. You know, it's very dangerous and kind of uh, partial. So I, so I thought the last few chapters of the book were really inspiring, both in the, the tone of love and openness that Catherine achieved, but in her willingness to say, well, of course, we're going to include new knowledge and we should and this will not distract us from the truth but it'll guide us toward it it's lovely you mentioned hope catherine and certainly the fact that the book ends with these horizons opened up by science but also explored by people like Terre de chaudin strikes a hopeful note that there are new new frontiers in the beyond that are only beginning to be explored um what what's your take on this well, how could I not be for science and faith uh, working together? You know, what did Einstein say that uh, science without religious religion is lame and religion without science is blind, uh, which I just think is wonderful. And I, and I think that there could be such a fruitful collaboration if people are open to it. But people have their turf, you know, people have their turf. And those for whom um, being... Uh, leaders within a faith community may feel as though their authority is challenged by people who might be lead leaders in an academic scientist uh, community. Um, they got to get over that. They got to get over that. Maybe they won't. Maybe it's just the rest of us in the middle who are trying to pull insights from both um, that will put put it together. But I love Teilhard's thing that, you know, that we are, he, he expands Darwin's notion of evolution to include meaning and events and narratives. And that we're all that into a sense, in, in a way, God is coming into consciousness consciousness as we move as we move forward indeed he calls humans the arrow of evolution so that's that's hopeful to me i'm going to go to the questions now the first question is going to be for catherine from john metzler 
What surprised you most in writing at the book or were you surprised not to be surprised? I was, I guess I was surprised at how rich other religious tra traditions were and how, how deeply I, res I reacted to them. That, that I didn't say, well, they believe this and they believe this, but I believe this. It wasn't that at all. It was the way in which speaking with a person of faith drew me so deeply into what they believed and what they hoped for. That was, it was a surprise and it was a grace. The next question is for George and it's posed to you in your, in your role as a writer of fiction. What are the dangers of writing about characters who are disembodied? Uh, and I guess, what are the pleasures of writing about characters right. who are disembodied? The question is from Joy Balio. Yeah, it's a great question. It was, it's, you know, when you're writing a book, you first find out what the, the problems are. And that was the first problem I came up against was I had a few months of just joyfully writing ghosts that could do anything and go anywhere. And you could just feel the imaginary reader's patience wearing thin with that. You know, the, a, a world of infinite possibilities is really, really boring. So I think that the trick of that embodiment is to say, well, you know, you guys need some constraints because otherwise you're unbearable. Uh, so then to start to develop the world. So like, well, what are the constraints? And one of them was that they actually aren't entirely unphysical. They look a certain way uh, and they think a certain way. They have, they have really restricted thoughts. Um, I had done a piece in Fresno where I lived in a homeless camp for a week, uh, kind of incognito. And I noticed there that the people, and there's a lot of you know, issues with mental health and so on. And one of the prevailing modes was the repetition of stories. People would corner me and tell me like the ancient mariner, why they were the only sane person in the place. And <laughs> well, that was something I brought to the, brought to the bar. But yeah, if you, I mean, constraint seems to me to be the, you know, you have to consent to constraint in order to make a, a, a believable fictional world. So I had many pages of just ghosts doing crazy stuff and it would just not have been enjoyable. So you have to give them real problems. And so in that sense, they're not really ghosts, you know, they're just people who have entered a different frame, I guess. There's a question from Michelle Junti, and it has to do with something we haven't touched on yet that I've wanted to bring up. Um, because George, your book is set in um, Oak Hill Cemetery, there's a strong sense, almost Aristotelian sense of uh, the space of the cemetery is the space of the bardo and is the space of the book. And entering the book, we enter the cemetery and enter the bardo. Uh, that's a fictional technique, but um, for the person asking the question, she's wondering how, what does that suggest about the sense of um, beyond as a kind of space behind our reality or other than our reality? Do you have anything to say to this and how it figured into work on the book? Well, I can only kind of speak practically. One thing was that whenever I tried to broaden the book beyond the graveyard, the energy dropped. So something about <laughs> that constraint was important. And then the, um, Another thing that kind of developed as I wrote it was the idea that that particular space looked different to the living and the dead. So the, to, to Lincoln, it was just a graveyard at night. That's it. Nothing, nobody in there but him. But to the dead people, it was a completely different space. So I think um, a lot of it was practical. You know, in other words, at some point you had to say, well, in this world, why, why are only these people here? And, well, you know, one of the answers that the book provides is, well, the, uh, <clears throat> the spirits stay um, near their burial spots. I doubt that's true in the real world, but for the, for the purpose of the book, it had to be true. And then that also started speaking about, well, who's included? So there's a grave, a grave, uh, a sort of a mass grave outside where the, some black people and some poor people were. Uh, so so in, a, in a certain way, the, the, uh, the constraints start making a physical world that you have to then honor after that, if that makes sense. <laughs> It does, and the bonus question, the bonus is for me. Uh, I've meant to ask you for 10 years now, well, no, since the book came out, uh, did you read Ironweed and did that bear on Lincoln and the Bardo at all? I read Ironweed a long time ago and I, long enough ago that I don't remember much. I remember the opening scene in that graveyard and that was beautiful, but. A couple of Catholic guys uh, who are alcoholics and make money for drinking by doing day labor at Albany uh, Catholic Cemetery. And uh, they, they're, they're digging graves and one of them's dead son begins to speak to him 
It's oh, one, wow. of the, um, <laughs> one of my favorite novels and also one of the great um, uh, Catholic or crypto Catholic novels of our time. And yeah. I just, it's the kind of uh, pop the question question that I've always wanted to ask you. Yeah, he's, he's a great writer. He, he was there in, in, uh, in Albany when we were there, when Paul was studying with Toni Morrison. He's a wonderful guy. I just love him. And now I'm going to ask him what he thinks of Lincoln and the Bardo at some point. <laughs> uh, Catherine, a question from Amelia, Amelia Aquino that, that I'll guard up with some of my own thoughts as well. Um, you know, so much of the writing that you do about the beyond is people who um, are religious figures and are preparing in a thoughtful and the way of the seeker for death. And that's just not the way it is for a lot of people. I was in connection with reading a George's book on the Russian writers, also reading a fair bit about Dostoevsky who faced the firing squad and then had the firing squad withdrawn after he'd already um, faced down his own death. Uh, the questioner is asking, what about people on death row and incarcerated people? How, how do the various ideas of beyond um, bear on, on death as encountered in that way? I need to write another book. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, I am thinking that the only answer to that would be for those people to be accompanied in some way. Now, obviously not somebody who gets hit by a car across the street. We talk about that instance, then you, have, you need to think about maybe incorporating into your life some awareness, some sense of preparation, some, some uh, sense of living a, a coherent life that might go someplace. Um, but for people who are in terribly difficult circumstances, um, I mean, my best answer would be to be able to accompany them. And that actually happens in um, the Tibetan Buddhism, uh, Buddhist tradition with the Thoa, where when somebody is dying, um, you know, a, a master will sit with them and, and kind of pray the way through and, 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 and let their spirit help the person out as they go. Now, as George and I were talking about, who gets to have that happen? I don't. Um, and so I think that is a very, very uh, pressing question that, that I don't think we have an answer for yet, but I do hope that we come to something like that about that, because certainly most of us are not really engaged in religious quest anymore. You, and you're all going to die. You're, you're, Catherine, your book made me think that, you know, we, we're so um, careful about health care when living, but this whole process of going through death, you know, and how, how brutal it would be to go through it alone, you know, or to go through it uh, with more pain than you needed to have, or to go through it without the sense of somebody, uh, it's in your book, or somebody just saying, basically, it's okay, you're, you're safe, you're okay. I mean, if you think about it, even when you had a flu, if somebody just says it's going to get better, it makes a big difference. So it's almost a deficiency in our culture that we that we haven't uh, made. I mean, there's hospice, which is wonderful, yes. um, that everybody should be taught from a young age to start getting ready <laughs> because it's going to happen. You know, that's and, right. And taught to, to be the person who accompanies other people as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, this was brought home in the pandemic because if um, our cultures, you know far from adept at dealing with death, and yet we still have enough of a sense of ritual to understand that um, people on the hour of their death should be accompanied by neighbors, by family, by caregivers. And the fact of um, I isolation and quarantine during COVID uh, took, that, um, took that away from so many people. They, they died profoundly alone uh, after a last, um, phone call or something with their relatives. And so from the deprivation that was felt by so many people in COVID, we can work our way back to um, the, the need to not only accompany one another in death, but for people to start doing that at a young age and sort of grasp the reality of death by, by accompanying um, people who are at the hour of their deaths. Yeah, and this makes me, Catherine, I had another question for you. You know, in, in the Buddhist tradition, there's some uh, teachings about what should happen to the body afterwards and whether it should be taught is are, did you notice in different traditions different uh, I guess notions that it isn't over when it's over and that there's still some care to be given uh, in the hour two three four hours after death uh, yes, but then of course there was the, the whole matter of immolation and scattering the ashes you know that that that, that they would take the body through phases 
just mm -hmm. physical phases. Um, yeah, that's that, you know, yeah. but the traditions are so, there are so many of them and they are often very local. Yeah. You know, they're not, they're not uniform. How about you? Did you find it? Well, I mean, I just read, some, I think we read something recently about uh, consciousness going on, a Canadian study that actually the mind was still working 10 minutes after death. And I'd read somewhere an interesting study about um, people who had been, uh, had impaired brain function, sort of comatose people. Uh, they pulled studies from when those people were uh, let off life support and there was some kind of scan involved. And they found that actually, these people say their normal brain function would have been impaired at a three or something, let's say. They found that after the death, and they had this crazily specific uh, number from three to, for three to 20 minutes, the brain function would go very high, 10, 10 ish, you know, uh, and then it would recede again. So that would, to me, that would imply that what we do with a, 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 a dead person afterwards is not irrelevant. It's not just like, well, that's now get rid of it or, I know in some cultures you're encouraged not to touch, you know, or to, you know, not to cry and so on. It's, I think that's in your book. So it's fascinating. Well, and also you're, what you're, what you're implying is that we should have a sense that you don't maybe not die in an instant. You, there may be a, really a passage. And I wish we had another hour to talk about near death experiences because there is a rich body of literature um, that, that now is becoming more and more scientifically verified and credible and all that. It's not, these are things that happen and there are uniform experiences. Um, and and they, you know, they, do, they do take some kind of time um, and, and of course, people don't actually die, they come back. But there is that sense of a whole lot going on after you've taken your last death, uh, breath. Catherine, well, one thing, I, the book ends in such a spirit of fullness. And I was wondering, just selfishly, what, what is the next thing that it occurs to you to write about after having this deep immersion? It's, I really want to learn how to go there now. Mm. I really want to study the Sufis and, and the, you know, Teresa Vavala and Ezekiel and the people who really in because I'm so not a mystic and never have it just fascinates me like mm -hmm. what is that all about and to what extent do they go there and that's just uh, that's what I would love to write about that's fascinating Dorothy Day uh, didn't cite much from Buddhism but she uh, made a number of references to the third half of life mm. First half <laughs> I of like life that education and preparation second half of life is really living your life and doing the things that you prepared to do. And the third half of life is for reflection on what's gone before and preparation for what's ahead. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the fact that you are moved by your own book to, um, to want to go deeper uh, as a participant in these activities is really powerful. It's certainly the feeling that it left me with Catherine. I, um, I felt like an amateur, but also one who was really emboldened by the book to um, be a little less this worldly in my uh, conception of religion, which is so much bound up with culture and literature and art, and to, to think about last things a little more and, and to do some, do some preparation, not in a morbid way, but uh, in kind of in a forward facing way. And it, it, so the book really worked in that respect. I don't know what your goal was, but that was its effect. Thank you, that was my goal. Yeah. A joyful way, actually. Yeah, someone once described to me, I mean, it's a classic effect, you know, writing about dark things, but with a, um, with a spirit of vitality. And that is very, very true of both of your books. Uh, the, um, the, the vitality that moves to the book, even when the material is, is very challenging and difficult. Um, the, I don't want to say life affirming or any cliche like that, but there's the, the the vitality that's part of all real art that's, that's present in these books. And uh, so thank you so much, Catherine, for Beyond. Oh, thank, thank you for, for Lincoln and the Bardo. Uh, I understand there's a film coming, is that right? Lincoln and the Bardo? Uh, yeah, hopefully, God willing, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> but, <laughs> there's always a film coming. <laughs> the book is sufficient unto itself for now. Uh, thanks so much there, to you. There's an opera coming, which is gonna, that is gonna happen and that'll be, the Met, so that'll be beautiful, I think. And who's the composer? Uh, Missy Mazzoli, and uh, Roth Bavak is the librettist, and I just saw the libretto, and it's really wonderful, so. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, like, like nine years from now, is an old, old opera that's about 
um, set in a similar space, I guess. So there's a very long tradition of um, this kind of liminal space being treated in opera. Yeah, it should be, should be fun. This is a really invigorating conversation. Thanks, George. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, President DeJoya. Um, thank you, East City Bookshop, which has the book for sale, signed and otherwise. And thanks to all uh, our um, sponsoring partners and to all of you in the audience who joined. I'm really glad to have you here. Uh, thanks again for a really enriching conversation. Have a good afternoon and uh, I'll see you again.